I've been involved with Swami Kriyananda and Yogananda's teachings since I was 22 years old. And that was a long time ago. <laughs> and from the time that it was presented to me that there was another way to live than the way that everyone had told me I had to live, I never looked back. I just seized it with heart, mind and spirit. And Divine Mother, as I, that's how I think about God, Divine Mother has just helped me along the way. And more recently, um, at Swami Kriyananda's direction, my actual job has been to qu travel as much as I can and share what Swami Kriyananda told me. And so here I am, and this has been for a few years what I've been doing. My way of thinking about it is that we're all children of the same Heavenly Father and Divine Mother. Many of us are close cousins because of Yogananda. So our Divine Mother has arranged play dates for us. Play dates, is a word we use in America all the time, where mothers get together and bring their little children together and look lovingly at them as they play together or sometimes fight together, but they're always together. And I feel that's what we're doing, we're finding each other. You know, this is a time in the world when there's a lot of um, shadow force as well as light force. And I prefer to think of it as shadow rather than dark because shadow can't exist unless there is light. And shadow is merely something that blocks the light, but the light is always there. And I have found now, traveling around the world, that the, the shadow gets all the publicity, but the real energy of the planet right now is the light. And so what I want to share with you today is really how to be instruments of the light, because that's our only job. And that's what I'll be talking about. The story of human life is really very different than most people understand it to be. The majority of people in the world just take life as it comes. And you think about who you're going to marry and what you're going to name your children and what job you're going to have, where you're going to live. These days, the options have vastly increased Things are easier and things are harder, it's just what it is. But the majority of people just take it like it comes. Um, when I was a young child, I was just bewildered by almost everything that was going on around me. Even though I managed to carry on, I was cheerful, I was well adjusted, but underneath it, I just I couldn't figure out what they were doing and why they found it so interesting. And I was also, I had one really um, intense desire and that was that I wanted to be happy. And it was a little bit ironic because I was happy. <laughs> I had a lovely family, we were comfortable, everything was fine, seemingly, but underneath it I always had this feeling that the only important thing to find out was how to be happy. And um, I was raised in a Jewish family, as it happened, and at the age of 13 in Jewish families, all boys and some girls, at the time I was coming, girls were treated more equally. Um, you have a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, and at that point you're considered to be an adult. It's a little premature, but anyway, you're considered to be an adult. The young man who stands up for his bar mitzvah says, now I am a man, you know, that's sort of part of the phrase that you use. So I had this idea in my mind that maybe when I turned 13, if I went and had that ceremony, which as it turned out, I never did, after it was over, all the grown-ups in my life would take me into some room and they would reveal to me the great secret of life. <laughs> that I presumed that they knew, that they just weren't letting me know about it until someday in the future. 
Well, 13 came and went, and that magic moment never happened. And as I got to be a teenager, I began, with ever-increasing anxiety, to realize that nobody knew that they were just taking it as it came and they expected me to follow the same path and do the same things. I was smart in school and if you're smart in school people think you can do anything. That was part of the confusion is that I was smart in school and like, so what? (laughs) But I could feel in some odd way, now I think about reincarnation and all kinds of things, but then I didn't know anything about that. I could just feel, let me see how to say it, I could see the end of those lives. I could could just really see the end of it. And in fact, when I was about, well actually I don't know what age it was, a little bit older, I had had this existential uh, crisis of sorts and in my mind I think I was awake all night but that's what you sort of say, you don't know if you're really awake all night but that's how I remembered it and I was contemplating the fact of death now to me death has never been some morbid unmentionable it just seems to me like it's such an obvious part of this story we should all be integrating it into our lives at that time I didn't even know anybody who had died what to speak of having any actual experience of it. Subsequently, because of the life I've lived, simply because I, as being part of an international group, the statistics say that I know a lot of people who've died now, (laughs) just because I know a lot of people. And also, because of my role, I've been invited to be at the bedside when various friends of mine and, and my own father have passed away, I've been there. At this time none of that was true. But I was contemplating my future and I know that my future would eventually mean the end of this incarnation. And I had this picture of what it would be like, which interestingly is very much like, what it, like the death vigils that I've been part of since. And I, ha- I knew it. Of course, when you put in reincarnation, many things become possible. So I was seeing myself at the end of my life and I presumed that I would have many children and you know the, the whole matriarch sort of picture was how I imagined it. In fact, I've never had any children but at that time I thought I'd have at least a dozen and they would all be crowding around with handkerchiefs, you know, when, I, when the great mother was dying, you know, the fantasy of youth. But what was so interesting to me was I could feel that when I exited this world no matter how many people loved me, no matter how deeply they loved me I would be on my own. I don't even know if I knew the word consciousness at that point but I could feel that my energy would just go farther and farther away from all of them. I never thought that consciousness would end. I somehow knew that consciousness would continue and I knew that would be all that I would have and all of those forms would become nothing. And therefore, my job was to make sure that my consciousness was what it was supposed to be. And it didn't matter if I was a doctor or a lawyer or a professor or a bazillionaire like none of those things would make any difference because it was all going to go away. And the realization of that was a powerful motivator but it was also exceedingly unsettling because at that time nobody was talking about consciousness. You know, in my, and I'll call it short, half century of being involved in these teachings I've seen the whole world shift over. When I became a vegetarian, which may not be such a popular thing in this country, I'm not sure, (laughs) but in any case, when I became a vegetarian at the age of 18, which would have been like 1966 or something like that, my relatives were certain that I would die, no question, and die very soon. (laughs) 
So they compelled me to write out everything that I ate and submit it to a medical doctor, you know, and they thought it would persuade me not to do it. The doctor said it was the healthiest diet he'd ever seen and I would outlive them all. <laughs> and that was the end of that. But even that, and of course I live in near San Francisco, California, which is the sort of the, the vanguard mm -hmm. of every new or wacky thing that happens, you know, is always happening big there. So in California now, and even when we started meditating, it was so radical. Now, in California at least, everybody knows what meditation is, or let me say, everybody thinks they know what meditation <laughs> is. It's quite different. And everybody who doesn't meditate feels guilty because they don't. So that's huge progress, you can see. You know, at least they know it's good and we should be doing it. So I see everything shifting. So when I was, let me think, I was 18, I was 18 years old. Um, I had already, <laughs> already entered and dropped out of university, never went back. Don't, don't ever send your children to me to persuade them to go to college. I'm <laughs> not good, okay. But I'd already gone to university and dropped out, like, what next? I went to university thinking what I, I see in retrospect. I wanted wisdom. I wanted to know what was true. And I went to a very prestigious university and they were very intelligent. They probably had more to teach me than I was willing to learn from them at that time. But they were only interested in knowledge. They were not interested in wisdom. And since I had no goals that required knowledge, I became disillusioned very, very quickly. As it happened, I don't know if, is the Grateful Dead something that made it to Argentina? The Grateful Dead was a big rock, rock and roll, what are the right words? You know, a band, very popular. They were just forming at the time. They were a huge cultural event in California. They were just forming when I was in college. And they were forming in the area where I was in university. And so what I did for the one year that I wasted my parents' money in university <laughs> was I would find out where they were playing every weekend and I would just go and I would... <laughs> but at the end I just went home and never went back. But as soon as I got back to my parents' home, I found friends that, I found acquaintances that I didn't know that well. Somebody handed me a book, and it was not Yogananda's book, it was by Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda is a magnificent disciple of a great avatar of the late 1800s in, in India. He died almost at exactly the same time Yogananda was born. These great ones passed the baton, you know, on. So there's always somebody around helping us to wake up. But it, it just spoke to me, and this is where reincarnation comes into it. The only words I can use are, I recognized. I recognized the teachings. It, it, I took no, it took no convincing. It just was the first time in my life that I met wisdom and not simply knowledge. And by that it meant, it wasn't just everybody's good idea of what might be, be right, it was actually based on experience of the only thing that really matters, which is how do we avoid suffering and how do we find happiness? Yogananda Paramahansa Yogananda, when he came to America in 1920, he published right away this small book which was called The Science of Religion. And of course some people think those two words are contradictory. But what he meant by the science of religion was that it can be proved by experiment. That's really what the concept of science is, that it's not a matter of opinion, is that you conduct experiments and then you find out what is consistently true. 
and in the scientific world about which I know nothing, I understand that the ability to replicate the experiment is part of how you can tell whether it's true, whether it was a lucky guess or whether you can recreate the same conditions and it'll happen again. So Yogananda taking thousands of years of ancient teaching of India and being his particular job and the, the story of these self-realized masters, avatar is the word. Avatar has come to mean something else in the world of uh, video games or what, I'm, I, I betray myself when I try to talk about these things. It's not that I'm incapable of knowing, it's that I don't want to know. <laughs> but the word avatar now means some personality that you create, which is mm, horrible. <laughs> Because <laughs> avatar is a magnificent word, but there we have it. These things will straighten themselves out over time. An avatar is, is, is someone like us. That's the most important aspect. Somebody like us who has, who has reached the top of the mountain. That's all. Walking up the same path, same arduous climb, same incredibly stupid mistakes over and over again, you know. It seemed like a good idea at the time, is the mantra that I use. When I look back at my life, it seemed like a good idea at the time. That's why I made that decision. And so here we are. But these avatars have, have no all, all personal concern has been overcome in the sense that they have come to understand that attunement with the divine power is the source of happiness and lack of attunement with that divine power is the source of suffering. And that's a, it's a very subtle, long process. But the avatars know um, how to climb the mountain, really. How to find happiness and avoid suffering. And they chart the route for us. And that's just all they're doing. They're just charting the route. But if we're in the valley and they talk about what it's like at the heights, sometimes it sounds like something that is so far outside our experience, we don't know right away that all I have to do is just keep climbing and I'll get there. So Yogananda was given this very interesting assignment. And all of this is a whole world view. For those of you who have read Autobiography, you've heard of at least some of it. And it has to do with the planet itself that we're living on. It, it doesn't take much insight to see that everything in the last 120 years has totally changed, just totally changed. I am old enough to remember before you could hold those devices and do all this like we're doing now. You know, they just simply didn't exist. It, 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 when, when you could have a telephone that wasn't um, stuck on the wall, that was a big, that was a really big thing, you know. But to speak of one you could take everywhere. The simple ease with which we got on a plane in San Francisco and, you know, just sat in that machine and it hummed and it moved and we, and then all of a sudden we get off the plane and here we are. I mean, this is 200 years ago unthinkable. Everything has changed because the whole, um, consciousness of the planet is going up. People say that things have been invented, but they haven't been invented, they've merely been discovered. You, you understand? They've, uh, relationships between one thing and another have been perceived and reassembled in ways that they, nobody ever thought of reassembling them before. Um, there are always visionaries who see it in advance. We were in uh, would it have been Serbia, Bel uh, Belgrade? And Tesla saw all of this and invented, invented all these cell phones, you know, before anybody even knew what the words were, because he, he had the expanded sight to see it. And so these great saints and masters, they just see, they see the pattern, and they see the divine laws, and they take a physical body, over and over again, uh, not as often as us, but over and over again, for one purpose, which is just to tell us about it. 
you know, to deliver, as, as Jesus called it, the good news. One of my favorite phrases from the entire Bible, the good news. You know, there is a way to find happiness, there is a way to avoid suffering. And the, the planet itself, Earth, this planet, because there, Yogananda, when Swami Kriyananda asked Yogananda, do we always incarnate on the same planet? Yogananda laughed. Oh no, he said, countless inhabited planets to choose from. We step out of the material world when we die, our consciousness continues in, in the form of a light and energy. Now there's so many movies who tell you all of this, I don't have to explain it. <laughs> you know, of light and energy, we review the whole story with fortunately guardian angels and gurus and masters around us who guide us as far as we're willing to be guided. Our own desires also come into it. The angel may whisper, that's not a good idea. <laughs> And we say, we have a very, very persuasive argument. Yes, it is. <laughs> and often, <clears throat> that's about the whole sum total of our reasoning. Yes, it is. If little children are like that. You know, we think it's so comical. <clears throat> we don't realize how, <clears throat> how much we're like that. Little child says, Mommy, from now on, I'm only going to have chocolate cake for breakfast. And mommy says, honey, you won't grow up to be a big boy if you eat chocolate cake for breakfast every morning. And the little boy says, yes, I will. <laughs> and that's that. So it's kind of the same. That's why it's very helpful to talk about the divine as your divine mother, your heavenly father, because it puts us in right relationship. That there is something, there's greater wisdom that we need to listen to. So the avatars come, and their power is on many levels, but not the least of it is because they have been through exactly, they've been through every stage of, of awakening that we ourselves have been through. I mean, that's amazing to contemplate. It's amazing to contemplate. There's nothing you can do that every great master who's ever lived hasn't also done it. That's what gives us hope. And on the planet right now, this planet is awakening. And this is, the fact that this planet is awakening is not a divine phenomenon per se. It's actually a physical phenomenon. This is astronomy. There is a, a center to the galaxy and a great deal of energy emanates from that center. And our solar system moves in an elliptical orbit and it gets closer and farther away from that center. And this is the actual, and it goes in the cycle is, it's a bit long, 24,000 years, 12 years of expand, 12,000 years of expanding consciousness, 12,000 years of declining consciousness, then what do you know? It turns the corner and starts all up again. This is the explanation for things like the pyramids. Who built them and how did they build them? Well, according to the movies, you had lots of, as it were, Jewish slaves with ropes pulling those big rocks up, but it doesn't make any sense. You know, you can't build by gross physical means something like that because they had other forms. One of the commonly held theories now is they could move physical objects with the power of sound. And even though that is more than we know how to do, how many of you, if you ever had a child, had a sonogram? which is taking a picture with sound waves, you know? And who could do that before? I, I don't wear glasses anymore because I had laser surgery on my eyes. I, I lay down on that little couch, I watched the little red thing for about two minutes, I stood up and I could see across the room without my glasses. Do I know how that was done? Not the slightest. But they did it with light, you know? Where does all this come from? It's always been there. But when there's more energy, then we have more awareness. However, what's happening on the planet is not our personal destiny, in the sense of you can't just get to planet Earth, grip the edge somewhere, 
and just hold on until earth gets enlightened and you'll get enlightened with it. You know, it seems like a good idea, but you can't do it. Physical body wears out and bingo, you're in the astral world again and you don't necessarily get to come back, especially not if you're looking for a free ride. Free ride is not something that is part of the plan, but it's the backdrop. It's the backdrop like a, or like a big opera, huge backdrop in which the singers or the actors come out on the stage and tell you their story and the backdrop helps you know what's going on. So the planet for us is the backdrop for the drama of, of individual awakening. And individual awakening, think about this for a minute, everything that we consider progress is that we become aware of something we weren't aware of before. Even just starting from a little baby, you know, sometimes they swaddle little infants because infants can be frightened by the sudden appearance of their own hands. They can't control their bodies and they're just lying there and then this object flies in front of them and it can startle and frighten them. And to us it's so quaint, but they're not aware of their own bodies. And every time we become aware of something that we weren't aware of before, now we know, we can't forget, we lived our lives not knowing it, but it wasn't that it wasn't there, is that we didn't have the capacity to perceive it. So when we watch how much we have become aware of that we didn't know, is there any limit to what we don't know and could know? You know? And how different things are sometimes when you become aware of something can be a buried quality within yourself, it can be a misperception of someone around you, an awakening of talents you didn't know you had. Everything is different after that and you can never unknow it once you know it. So when Yogananda incarnated, he was born in 1893 and his, he was the first Indian uh, master of, his, of mag his magnitude, whose entire mission was to carry the teaching out of India and into what we used to call, I don't know whether we still call it, the Western world, you know, which is a, as opposed to the Eastern world. These distinctions are becoming quite garbled because everybody is everywhere right now. But he, he had to take everything from thousands of years of Indian teaching and, and reform it for a culture and a country that had never heard of it before. Among the many things, now of course I'm American so I'm going to refer to my culture here, but we're, we have comical characteristics that the world knows, <laughs> as do the Argentinians, but there we have. <laughs> but it's just, we're all in this together, okay? Um, Yogananda says in India, when you talk to people about realizing God, becoming self-realized and eternally free, Indians traditionally, who are steeped in the idea of reincarnation and karma, they will say, oh yes, someday, but my karma, not this lifetime, maybe another lifetime. So when Yogananda would say to Americans, you can realize God, Americans would say, sure, we can do it. <laughs> because we think we can do anything like that. But that's why he came to, the, to, the, to Los Angeles, California. He could have gone anywhere in the world, but he wanted to bring a new message, a new message for a new age, which is, this is what we're all looking for. We're looking for the science of religion. We're not looking for dogmas, we're not looking for rules that say, if you do this, then you'll get that. One of my friends who was raised Catholic went to Catholic school when he was about six years old at the beginning. These very fierce nuns were his teachers. And they said, if you're good, if you're a good little boy, 
you'll get a bigger house in heaven, they told him. <laughs> he thought this was terrific news because he didn't care how big his house in heaven was and therefore he didn't have to be good. <laughs> but we don't buy that anymore because it's a different age. We just, it doesn't make sense to us little tiny ideas like that. And it's also we're moving from what's, what's called the age of form where everything was fixed. This is very important, more important than you may realize because this world is in a lot of confusion right now and I know your country has been experiencing America's just teetering on the edge of what will probably be many chaotic years coming. But we are, we have to find a way to understand a little more deeply what's going on in the world, not only for the security of our own hearts, but also to know more clearly what's being asked of us or more, to put it another way, why the heck did I choose to be born now? <laughs> you know, if this was a conscious, intelligent decision, what was I thinking? <laughs> and, and how can I fulfill, you know, my ever-increasing um, journey of awareness? Like this, how can I come to it? So when Yogananda started talking about religion as science, what he was trying to say was, try it. See how it works for you. You know, don't just take somebody's word for it, because it, you know, these, all these systems, these forms, in the age just before this one, which was called Kali, which means dark, in that sense, in that usage, the age, everything was fixed form. You know, you had a religion, you had your country, you had your language, you had your culture, you had your family, and everything just stayed there. And on a certain level it was comforting, and on a certain level it was suffocating. So it goes both ways. Now we're moving into an age of energy. And energy can take any form at all. This is what science is telling us now that this whole material world is just energy in different forms. And what the science of yoga tells us is that we ourselves are just energy. This gets into the metaphysics of the chakras and the chakras and the law of karma and reincarnation are all one beautifully integrated system because if it's only energy and if we are really just an energy pattern manifesting through a physical body, then we work with the energy. This is what Bhakti Marg was doing at the beginning. Look, I can make myself strong just by my own will because it's nothing but energy. But it's much deeper than that. Our awareness is a pattern of energy and our awareness can be shifted by the intelligent application of another kind of energy, just like that. We have an energy pattern of bigotry, let's say, and then we have experiences either of being prejudiced against or of being prejudiced against someone else and then gradually learning that there's no, this doesn't make any sense and a higher state of awareness comes to us when we begin to change. So in the world right now, as we move into this age of energy, we're trying to understand what the right experiment is, you know, and how to actually find out from our own experience what causes suffering and what brings happiness. In Yogananda's little book that I referred to, every sentient being, you know, down to the tiniest creature, you could have a worm and you poke that worm with a pin, it suffers, it moves away from it. It, it understands that I am suffering and I can move away. It doesn't have a very sophisticated idea of what life is. It can't, it doesn't, worms do not have existential crises. They can't objectify their own experience, but the human mind can. And so these masters come and they bring the message. Now every avatar throughout all of recorded or forgotten history 
has exactly the same state of consciousness. Now, we have karma. Karma is another one of those wonderful words that the more commonly it's used, the less it's understood. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's not an important word. I saw many years ago in, in the US, there's a series, there were a series of books called Harlequin Romances. I'm sure there's an equivalent here, or maybe the same, in which, you know, he and she always have this, and it follows the pattern, and in about page 120, he kisses her for the first time, you know, and all of this happens after that, and they're wonderful. I used to read them, because they always ended happy. <laughs> the good guys always won, and it was wonderful. Well, they, they were for sale in the supermarket, and there was a, a a cover, and it was a very torrid picture. You know, she's very voluptuous and looks rather <laughs> like this. And she has, all, you know, much of her body is not inside her dress, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the picture says, was it Meredith's karma to be with Robert? <laughs> or would her karma take her to live with Edward like this? <laughs> And I thought, you know, this is the good news and this is the bad news. We've arrived. What, what karma is, and it's very important, is cause and effect in human life. And even though we have this sort of feeling of helplessness in regard to it, because often the effects that we're reaping now were created by causes in lifetimes we no longer remember. Now, if you ask me why it's all set up this way, I don't know. <laughs> and if, if I were God, I would set it up differently, but he's never asked me. So this is the way it is. We, we put these causes out and then we reap the effects, which is to say, it's all, this is the good news. It's all a decision that we made. I remember at one point in my life, when I was living in the first Ananda community. And our lives were very, very different at that point. We were living very isolated. None of these uh, devices were available that would connect. We didn't even have electricity or indoor plumbing. It was wonderful, <laughs> extremely simple. Uh, when I finally moved into a house with electricity, it was really dynamic to my awareness how much restlessness is created by the mere presence of electricity. In this world you can't, it's a compromise, you know. So I, I have happily lived with electricity for 40 years and it's fine, but when I first moved into that house it was like, wow, this is real. We don't even know it now, but it's real. So, um, oh yes, I was I had gotten myself into a certain amount of trouble, which I had gotten myself into a certain amount of trouble quite a few times over the years. Less so now, but I have. And I'd gotten myself into a certain amount of trouble and I was feeling pathetic, very pathetic, very sorry for myself. And it, it finally just crossed my mind, Asha, you got yourself into this mess by just walking too far in that direction why don't you just turn around and walk back? You know, and it was just so simple, and I just, and I did. I just immediately started walking back. And that's what karma is, is that something is, karma is an unlearned lesson. Something we don't know about what brings happiness and what causes suffering. Sometimes the letter, lessons are very subtle, and sometimes the way the lesson comes to you is a bit of a mystery package. But the, the, if, you, if you reflect on it, the result is always the same. Something is interrupting my experience of happiness. And I have to deal with that in order to get back to what we intuitively know is our natural state. It's, it's also something interesting to contemplate. If we were destined only to suffer, if, if we knew that that was the reality, there wouldn't be even this thought that it should be different. This is just the way things are. I'm conscious, I suffer, there you have it. 
But when we suffer, we deeply understand that something is wrong. And that suffering is the way that our higher self gets our attention. Pay attention. Something that you're doing is not in tune with the divine energy, with the light. We have created a shadow and we are unaware of the light. The light is exactly the same. It's that we have blocked it by our thoughts, by our actions, by our feelings. And we have to figure out, what do I need to do differently? And the rules, the rules can't be just written down in one book. When this happens, do this. When this happens, do that. That's what the institutions of religions tried to tell us. If you do this, you'll be saved. You'll get the bigger house in heaven. If you do that, you'll be damned. But it eh, doesn't quite work like that. And also, if I'm afraid, when I was 18 years old, or by that time I was probably 19, I, um, I realized that I was, generally speaking, a harmonious person. But my, the, the origin point of my harmonious nature was not actually a love for harmony. It was a fear of conflict. So even though I looked a certain way, and see, this is form versus energy. Even though I looked a certain way, it wasn't really love I was expressing. It was fear that I was expressing. And in the Bible, St. John puts the opposite of love is fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. That was one of the things I read in Vivekananda's book. Only later did I realize it came from the, the New Testament. So I didn't really love, I was fearful. So it wasn't love that I needed to cultivate first. First I needed to cultivate overcoming that fear. Even though I've lived in California most of my adult life, at that time I was spending the summer in New York City. California is very mellow, you know, we're nice, we're easy going out there. New York City is not, okay? They're tough in New York and they push you around a lot. So it was a perfect place for me to learn to just be a little less afraid because you could be so rude in New York City and people just thought it was normal, <laughs> right? So I was able to just learn to be this aggressive person. I would push my way to the front of the line. I would beat the others to the taxi cab. I would call out the, the vegetable seller when he put his thumb on the scale to charge me more money. You know, take your thumb off the scale, buddy. And he would just laugh and take his thumb off the scale. You know, it wasn't a big deal. Then I began, I got good at it. Then I began to enjoy it. I began to look for opportunities to be aggressive and mean. <laughs> and I realized, lesson learned, now we're creating new karma of a bad kind. <laughs> so we have to dial this back a little bit. It's a very graphic example. I'm sure you can run your own story. It's always an unlearned lesson. And for some, they need to just shut up and be cooperative. And others of us need, need to, needed to learn to just stand up and have a little self-respect because we're all trying to get to the balance point and we, we're like a pendulum. We keep swinging to one side or the other. And what happens, as I was saying at the beginning, once you really learn, you don't go back. Yogananda said something that's truly chilling if you think about it. He said, we only really learn from actual experience. If, if you think about it, you listen politely when someone tells you what's true, but you don't believe it until you experience it. Or if you do cooperate with it, it's often not because you really believe it, but because you're afraid. And that's, fear is not the same as wisdom. Okay? So we, um, just the moment I lost the thread. Uh, so we, oh yes, Yogananda said, everything that you're no longer attracted to, everything that you can tell is not going to make you happy, 
is because you have actually tried it, you, you, you reap the fruit of that particular delusion, and now you really know it. This, re- this applies to really egregious behaviors too. Like why do people murder other people? Why do people steal? Why do people use their power in ways that are extraordinarily detrimental? It's because they think it's going to make them happy. And they think it's going to cause them to avoid suffering. How are they going to find out that it doesn't work? Well, they're going to get the karma. They're going to get the effect of those actions. Right. Now, this is where I have to say, the law of karma is an exceedingly challenging teaching. It's exceedingly challenging because if karma is true anywhere, it has to be true everywhere. And that puts us in front of what appears to us to be extraordinary injustice. And, and you have to be able to understand that everything happens for a divine purpose, for the ultimate good, not the short-term good, but the ultimate good of whoever is experiencing that. So I never <laughs> try to persuade anyone to accept this. I'm just putting it forward. And when you can finally, now I'll I'll tell you a piece of this because I've touched into this very serious part of it. Um, In in 1986, um, I, I and three of my friends started leading pilgrimage tours to India, mostly Americans, almost entirely Americans, who'd never been outside of the Western world and had never been into a country like India. And India is a completely different country, but in 1986 it was much closer to what it used to be. It was even at that point closed to foreign corporations. It was still had the Gandhian influence. So we saw a lot of things in that country that we'd never people had never seen before. We stayed in the Oberoi Grand Hotel in Calcutta, which is it was in fact a grand hotel. I'm generally a very simple person, but because of my travels in India, especially during those years, I have a great weakness for luxury hotels. <laughs> it's because I got to experience this marvelous world. It's not a serious thing, but I do enjoy it. So we're in this luxury hotel. At that time in India, there was top tier and bottom tier. And so when you took Americans, you had to go top tier. Um, and, and I was on this like sixth floor, and the week that we were there, I could look down and I could watch the family who was living on the sidewalk, right at the edge of the building. I mean, that's actually where they lived. It wasn't just that they happened to be there for a while. They just lived on that sidewalk. And I watched them run their life from my marble bathroom, you know, place. And I observed that our groups, and, and we did this for about 20 years. I took maybe 10 or 15 times. I took groups over there. People seeing human suffering on a level that was not common, people had extremely different reactions to it. And it was so like puzzling to me because we were all looking at the same thing. And for most of them, we were all seeing it for the first time. And, but people, some people just became panicked, is the only word I can think of, at the sight of that kind of suffering. And we would have to protect them, you know, and you know, take them through the streets and so on. Others were just perfectly at ease. They would chat with the beggars, they would chat with the people, the lepers, and you know, they would chat with the people on the sidewalk and just like, you know, I'm a human, you're a human, let's just share a little bit. And I began to feel, and this is what I believe is true, Everyone suffers. I mean, if you've been spared, it's probably in front of you. But everybody suffers, meaning that it just hasn't come due yet. And all of us seem to suffer basically to the limit of what we can do. And what is, is, is intense for me may be nothing for you, and what is intense for you may be nothing for me, because we all have different karma, don't we? We all have set different effects, we have different lessons to learn. And the degree to which, as an individual, one has accepted that much as I don't like it, 
Suffering tends to teach me something I needed to learn that I could not have learned in any other way. And even though I think it's a terrible system, (laughs) I have to admit in my own life that it's worked. You know, in part of becoming more mature to the extent that I have become more mature. When I lived with Swami Kriyananda, when I knew him, by the time he died, which was 45 years after I met him, I, I, I had progressed. When I was with him, I tended to feel that I was about... I was like maybe a precocious nine-year-old. That's basically how I felt. By the time he died, I'd probably reached the age of 12 or 13. I could stay at home without a babysitter. That's how I felt. That's how old I was. Compared to him, I always felt like a child. We had to buy tickets once for a boat ride. Two women two of us, we were 30, whatever, Swami was 50 at that time. The, the attendant says, how many adults, how many children? I really wanted to say one adult, two children. But I knew if we showed up at 30 years old with half price children's tickets, they wouldn't let us in. But compared to, that's really how I felt. Because there's so many things that we don't understand. And once you go through one of those really hard experiences, if you do it with an open heart and an open mind, Many people just close down and become bitter. But if you're really trying to grow, at the end of it, you have to say, oh, phooey, it worked. So if you're looking at other people and they're going through hard times, now we can talk about on a global scale what's happening thousands of miles from us, which we can still feel, or we can talk about just what's happening to me right now, or what's even worse, what's happening to the people I love. Watching the people you love suffer is really worse than suffering yourself. But think about it this way. If the result of this suffering is that this person will come to know a freedom and a power and a happiness that they would never be able to reach if they didn't face into this karma accept what they have to learn, and learn it. Would you want them not to have that opportunity to learn? You see how tricky that gets? When my parents were in the last years of their lives, my parents died about 20 years ago now, they, um, my mother declined physically, and uh, toward the end my father just took a little mental holiday. He just sort sort of been dealing with my mother's illness for a long time, and he just went on a holiday for a couple of years, and then she died just at that time. And then he was, he he was actually very happy and very sweet. He just checked out. But when it all began to come down, I'm very executive. I have a lot of willpower. I can organize things. They lived. I lived in San Francisco, and they in Los Angeles. So it was a short plane ride. And by the grace of God, there was enough money for me to take that plane ride whenever I needed to. So I just decided to take over their lives. You know, and I started organizing everything according to what I thought it ought to be. You might intuit that they didn't like that at all. Zero. Not at all. And I finally realized that, once again, I was not motivated by love. I was motivated by fear. I needed to take over their lives so their lives would follow the pattern that would be convenient for me. Just like that. So their lack of enthusiasm and my uh, expanding awareness coincided nicely and I backed up. I thought to myself several things. First I thought, I mean, really, this is just to give you hope. It takes a long time to learn this. I'd only been studying these teachings for 30 years at that point, so I was still a novice. I said, uh, it's their karma. It's like they, they've been working their whole lives to get to this point, to have these lessons. What, what, why am I trying to prevent them from having the experiences that they need to have? I mean, of course, I could help them in their lives, having an attentive daughter who wants to do what you want her to do was a nice thing to have. But I was just trying to cut in and make it my, mine instead of theirs. And then this came to me. I'm not afraid of my karma, not anymore. I've faced into enough things that, 
okay, if you want to send me another one, we'll figure it out. You know, again, if I had a choice, I would just, it would just be ease and pleasure right to the end, but that's not what's going to happen. But I'm not afraid of it, because if God sends it to me, He's going to send me the energy to take care of it. It's a divine law that you never get a test that's bigger than you can pass. You get one that's right to the edge, and may take you more than one incarnation, but you'll win by the end, right? So, <laughs> Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, God never sends me anything that he knows I, except what he knows I can handle. And then she said, I, sometimes I wish God didn't have such a high opinion of me. <laughs> <laughs> but I realized I wasn't afraid of my karma, but I was afraid for other people. And I realized, wow, among other things, that is super disrespectful. And I realized that was the dynamic that was playing out with my parents. I was just coming in and acting like they were morons. You see, all of this comes down to, and this is what we're talking about, how to live these teachings. Bhakti Marg was helping us understand that there are techniques that we can use to increase our personal power, our personal strength. But what is the purpose of all of that? It's increasing awareness, which leads to greater happiness and less suffering. But you see, there's another part of it here. And this is where it becomes science and it becomes experience, which is, well, the word is faith. And we tend not to think of faith as being science. But when, when you actually can experience in your life how this works, you know, how there are really divine laws, that karma is real, and there's so much more to this. This is just an introduction, because you... How does karma transfer from life to life? Well, that's the, about the chakras. You know, those are the energy pattern. That's, that's, that's who we really are. And all of that has enormous, fascinating dimensions, which you can find more and more about this. I don't know of Yogananda's teachings, what is available, but I know that there is a great deal available in Spanish now, so you can work with it. But the... um, Let me find the thought for a moment here. Oh, but the point is, once you really know that something is true, as I was saying, you can't unknow it. And even if you rebel, I'm going to use the word we, which is more accurate, even if we rebel against it, once you really know it, once that rebellion is over, you come back to what you know to be true. And that's what faith is. I just know this is true. I didn't understand karma or reincarnation or any of this when it was first presented to me, but heavens, nothing anybody else had said made any more sense. So I started experimenting in my own mind, just like, what if there was such a thing as karma? What if there was such a thing as reincarnation? And I was looking at something I didn't understand, I couldn't make sense out of. How would that relate? And I, I just did that with, with a great deal of willpower and energy over and over and over until I had faith. But it wasn't faith because somebody told me. It was because I'd really watched, paid attention to myself and to the world around me until I came to that point. I was caught in a difficult situation that involved people that I love and that involved a hospital. People were in the hospital, I was there. I'm sure you've all been in, or you may have been. And because of my nature, I, I can often sort of hold, hold the energy s- strongly and people come to depend on me, which is perfectly acceptable to me. But People that I loved were in the hospital. I was... People were depending on me not to fall to pieces. I was falling to pieces, so I left the hospital and went and sat in the car in the parking lot. I imagine the car in the parking lot of hospitals has seen some pretty intense moment. I suspect there's a lot of angels in the parking lot because there's so many people who need angelic intervention. 
So now that I'm alone in the car, I just gave vent to my frustration. And just in the middle of despair and rebellion against why is this even happening, I felt like a voice. It came in my right ear, ear, it it went through my brain like that, and somehow it came out my left ear. I know that's not how voices really work, but that's how it felt. And it said, could this be happening outside the will of God? And it was such a naughty question, I really didn't like it. I just felt really like a child having a tantrum, you know? I'm having a tantrum, don't try to reason with me. One of my friends, when her little boy, when her little boy was having a tantrum, she put him in his room, shut the door, she heard him continue for a while, then it got quiet, so she opened the door and said, Honey, are you done? And he said, Not quite, Mommy. <laughs> and then he went back and screamed and yelled a little longer, and then he was finished. So I was having a tantrum, and I had been interrupted. Could this be happening outside the will of God? And I was trapped. <laughs> I was trapped by my own past experience. That I, I, I had come to know that there's always a reason. And it's always a loving reason from those angelic beings and from God, from Divine Mother. It's always ultimately to bring us to greater happiness and to release us from suffering. So then I came up with a prayer that has really worked for me. I said, okay, God, and I was, I didn't, and I meant it to sting, you know, God, if you're going to do this, then whatever it is you're trying to teach these people, you'd better help them to learn it. And then I added, and really fast, (laughs) because I am going down. I, I can't do this much longer. And that has become something, that's how I deal with it. Whatever it is you're trying to teach them, or me, you know, help, help us to learn it. And why not, let's do it a little faster. Yeah? And then you begin to see, and in that particular case, I walked back into the hospital, the crisis had shifted, everything from that point just it was comparatively easy compared to where we had been. It doesn't always happen that fast, but in this case it did. And taught me something I would never have learned. Oh dear, suffering works. Okay. And then the last part of this, and then I'll give us a break here, is what is the end point of all of this? And this is where the message of the Masters is so important. Our true nature is bliss. If we were meant to suffer, we would be content to suffer. But we always know that this is something is wrong here. That it's, it's, it's something that's planted in us that we can't escape. You know, I'm, I'm meant for something else. And it's only a question of how soon and how dynamically I'm going to get there. You know, happiness is not something we create. Uh, bliss, which is a better word, I don't know what the Spanish various words are, but bliss is our true nature, and we put shadow over that bliss. That's where the word shadow is. Everything is light. In the beginning, you know, they say in the beginning was the word, which is the sound of the Om, and the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. Light is the fundamental reality. And when you have experiences sometimes of spirituality, everything just turns into light. You just see it. And, and it, it can be blocked, but it can never be destroyed. And then our job becomes really simple, to live in the light and to share the light. And Yogananda's path, Kriyananda's teaching, which of course has been my whole life, it's just one pathway to the light. And even the way Yogananda taught it, it's, it's not about my way to the light, it's just the light. And everybody, no matter what they think or believe or, or call themselves, they can call themselves atheists if they want to, 
but, but it's how you live, who you really are. You know, am I moving through this world doing my best to be an instrument of light? And don't think that you have to make a big impact on history. The people who make the big impact on history just disappear over time. You know, who remembers anybody from the life of Christ except those who were connected to Christ? All the rest of them who were really big honchos at that time, you know, big or nothing now, zero. Because the light was the real power. And in our own little story, the planet is just the backdrop. The story is my ability to attune to the light. That's all. So in every, and, and, and what is so fascinating is that it's a minute by minute experience. Yogananda made this statement, take care of the minutes and incarnations will take care of themselves. That's quite a statement. I contemplate it a lot. There is no minute of your life which is less or more important because every single thing that we do creates the energy pattern. And then that energy pattern is really who we are much more than the body that we're wearing. You know, when you meet people, what you feel is their energy, isn't it? Yeah, you feel their aura. We have words for it now, but that's what you feel. This person has good energy. This person has bright energy. This person has no energy. <laughs> and that's what it really is. And when we take off the material body, when we die, and now we have all these wonderful death and return stories, you just take off the body like you take off the dress. You know, sometime at the end of this long day, whatever it is, I'm going to be in my nightgown, but it's still going to be me. And if you saw me in my nightgown, you wouldn't say, where's the blue dress? Who are you? You know, my head would tell you who I was. <laughs> A little girl went from kindergarten to first grade. Her father said to her, what is your new teacher like? She said, pretty much like the other one with a different head. <laughs> That's how we recognize each other from life to life, too. We're wearing different heads. But the energy pattern is the same when we recognize each other. We see like that. And that energy pattern is made by every thought, every feeling, every action. So nothing is unimportant. Just always turn toward the light. And this, these are not absolutes. It's not like you're either in light or dark. It's just that you have a little more or a little less. And even if you're just a little more, that's a lot, because it begins to shift the whole pattern, like that. 